Volume Two, Chapter One, of The Last Man. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. During this voyage, when on calm evenings we conversed on deck, watching the glancing of the waves and the changeful appearances of the sky, I discovered the total revolution that the disasters of Raymond had wrought in the mind of my sister. Were they the same waters of love, which lately cold and cutting as ice, repelling as that, now loosened from their frozen chains, flowed through the regions of her soul in gushing and grateful exuberance? She did not believe that he was dead, but she knew that he was in danger, and the hope of assisting in his liberation, and the idea of soothing by tenderness the ills that he might have undergone, elevated and harmonized the late jarring element of her being. I was not so sanguine as she, as to the result of our voyage. She was not sanguine, but secure, and the expectation of seeing the lover she had banished, the husband, friend, heart's companion from whom she had long been alienated, wrapped her senses in delight, her mind in placidity. It was beginning life again, it was leaving barren sands for an abode of fertile beauty. It was a harbour after a tempest, an opiate after sleepless nights, a happy waking from a terrible dream. Little Clara accompanied us. The poor child did not well understand what was going forward. She heard that we were bound for Greece, that she would see her father, and now for the first time she prattled of him to her mother. On landing at Athens we found difficulties increase upon us, nor could the storied earth or balmy atmosphere inspire us with enthusiasm or pleasure, while the fate of Raymond was in jeopardy. No man had ever excited so strong an interest in the public mind. This was apparent even among the phlegmatic English, from whom he had long been absent. The Athenians had expected their hero to return in triumph. The women had taught their children to lisp his name, joined to thanksgiving. His manly beauty, his courage, his devotion to their cause, made him appear in their eyes almost as one of the ancient deities of the soil descended from their native Olympus to defend them. When they spoke of his probable death and certain captivity, tears streamed from their eyes. Even as the woman of Syria sorrowed for Adonis, did the wives and mothers of Greece lament our English Raymond. Athens was a city of mourning. All these shows of despair struck Perdita with affright, with that sanguine but confused expectation which desire engendered while she was at a distance from reality. She had formed an image in her mind of instantaneous change, when she would set her foot on Grecian shores. She fancied that Raymond would already be free and that her tender attentions would come to entirely obliterate even the memory of his mischance. But his fate was still uncertain. She began to fear the worst, and to feel that her soul's hope was cast on a chance that might prove a blank. The wife and lovely child of Lord Raymond became objects of intense interest in Athens. The gates of their abode were besieged. Audible prayers were breathed for his restoration. All these circumstances added to the dismay and fears of Perdita. My exertions were unremitted. After a time I left Athens and joined the army stationed at Kishan in Thrace. Bribery, threats, and intrigue soon discovered the secret that Raymond was alive, a prisoner, suffering the most rigorous confinement and wanton cruelties. We put in movement every impulse of policy and money to redeem him from their hands. The impatience of my sister's disposition now returned on her, awakened by repentance, sharpened by remorse. The very beauty of the Grecian climate, during the season of spring, added torture to her sensations. The unexampled loveliness of the flower-clad earth, the genial sunshine and grateful shade, the melody of the birds, the majesty of the woods, the splendor of the marble ruins, the clear effulgence of the stars by night, the combination of all that was exciting and voluptuous in this transcending land, by inspiring a quicker spirit of life, and an added sensitiveness to every articulation of her frame, only gave edge to the poignancy of her grief. 
each long hour was counted and he suffers was the burthen of all her thoughts she abstained from food she lay on the bare earth and by such mimicry of his enforced torments endeavoured to hold communion with his distant pain i remembered in one of her harshest moments a quotation of mine had roused her to anger and disdain for dita i had said some day you will discover that you have done wrong in again casting raymond on the thorns of life when disappointment has sullied his beauty when a soldier's hardships have bent his manly form and loneliness made even triumph bitter to him then you will repent and regret for the irreparable change will move in hearts all rocky now the late remorse of love the stinging remorse of love now pierced her heart she accused herself of his journey to greece his dangers his imprisonment she pictured to herself the anguish of his solitude she remembered with what eager delight he had in former days made her the partner of his joyful hopes with what grateful affection he received her sympathy in his cares she called to mind how often he had declared that solitude was to him the greatest of all evils and how death itself was to him more full of fear and pain when he pictured to himself a lonely grave my best girl, he had said, release me from these fantasies. United to her, cherished in her dear heart, never again shall I know the misery of finding myself alone, even if I die before you, my Perdita. Treasure up my ashes till yours may mingle with mine. It is a foolish sentiment for one who is not a materialist. Yet, methinks, even in that dark cell, I may feel that my inanimate dust mingles with yours, and thus have a companion in decay." In her resentful mood these expressions had been remembered with acrimony and disdain. They visited her in her softened hour, taking sleep from her eyes, all hope of rest from her uneasy mind. Two months passed thus, when at last we obtained a promise of Raymond's release. Confinement and hardship had undermined his health. The Turks feared an accomplishment of the threats of the English government, if he died under their hands. They looked upon her recovery as impossible. They delivered him up as a dying man, willingly making over to us the rites of burial. He came by sea from Constantinople to Athens. The wind, favourable to him, blew so strongly in shore that we were unable, as we had at first intended, to meet him on his watery road. The watchtower of Athens was besieged by inquirers, each sail eagerly looked out for, till on the first of May the gallant frigate bore in sight, freighted with treasure more invaluable than the wealth which, piloted from Mexico, the vexed Pacific swallowed, or that was conveyed over its tranquil bosom to enrich the crown of Spain. At early dawn the vessel was discovered bearing in shore. It was conjectured that it would cast anchor about five miles from land. The news spread through Athens, and the whole city poured out at the gates of the Piraeus. Down the roads, through the vineyards, the olive woods, and plantations of fig leaves towards the harbour. The noisy joy of the populace, the gaudy colours of their dress, the tumult of carriages and horses, the march of soldiers intermixed, the waving of banners and sound of martial music added to the high excitement of the scene, while round us reposed in solemn majesty the relics of ancient time. To our right the Acropolis rose high spectatress of a thousand changes of ancient glory turkish slavery and the restoration of dear-bought liberty tombs and cenotaphs were strewn thick around adorned by every renewing vegetation the mighty dead hovered over their monuments and beheld in our enthusiasm and congregated numbers a renewal of the scenes in which they had been the actors perdita and clara rode in a close carriage i attended them on horseback at length we arrived at the harbour. It was agitated by the outward swell of the sea. The beach, as far as could be discerned, was covered by a moving multitude, which, urged by those behind toward the sea, again rushed back as the heavy waves with sullen roar burst close to them. I applied my glass, and could discern that the frigate had already cast anchor, fearful of the danger of approaching nearer to a lee shore. A boat was lowered, with a pang I saw that Raymond was unable to descend the vessel's side. He was let down in a chair, and lay wrapped in cloaks at the bottom of the boat. 
I dismounted and called to some sailors who were rowing about the harbour to pull up and take me into their skiff. Perdita at the same moment alighted from her carriage. She seized my arm. "'Take me with you,' she cried. She was trembling and pale. Clara clung to her. "'You must not,' I said. "'The sea is rough. He will soon be here. Do you not see his boat?' The little bark to which I had beckoned had now pulled up. Before I could stop her, Perdita, assisted by the sailors, was in it. Clara followed her mother. A loud shout echoed from the crowd as we pulled out of the inner harbour. While my sister at the prow had caught hold of one of the men who was using a glass, asking a thousand questions, careless of the spray that broke over her, deaf, sightless to all except the little speck that, just visible on the top of the waves, evidently neared. We approached with all the speed six rowers could give, the orderly and picturesque dress of the soldiers on the beach, the sounds of exulting music, the stirring breeze and waving flags, the unchecked exclamations of the eager crowd, whose dark looks and foreign garb were purely eastern, the sight of temple-crowned rock, the white marble of the buildings glittering in the sun, and standing in bright relief against the dark ridge of lofty mountains beyond. The near roar of the sea, the splash of oars and dash of spray, all steeped my soul in a delirium, unfelt, unimagined in the common course of common life. Trembling, I was unable to continue to look through the glass, with which I had watched the motion of the crew when the frigate's boat had first been launched. We rapidly drew near, so that at length the number and forms of those within could be discerned, its dark sides grew big, and the splash of its oars became audible. I could distinguish the languid form of my friend, as he half raised himself at our approach. Perdita's questions had ceased. She leaned on my arm, panting with emotions too acute for tears. Our men pulled alongside the other boat. As a last effort my sister mustered her strength, her firmness. She stepped from one boat to the other, and then with a shriek she sprang towards Raymond, knelt at his side, and gluing her lips to the hand she seized, her face shrouded by her long hair, gave herself up to tears. Raymond had somewhat raised himself at our approach, but it was with difficulty that he exerted himself even thus much. With sunken cheek and hollow eyes, pale and gaunt, how could I recognize the beloved of Perdita? I continued awestruck and mute, he looked smilingly on the poor girl. The smile was his. A day of sunshine falling on a dark valley displays its before-hidden characteristics. And now this smile, the same with which he first spoke love to Perdita, with which he had welcomed the perfectorate, playing on his altered countenance, made me in my heart's core feel that this was Raymond. He stretched out to me his other hand. I discerned the trace of manacles on his bared wrist. I heard my sister's sobs, and thought happy are women who can weep, and in a passionate caress dispur them the oppression of their feelings. Shame and habitual restraint hold back a man. I would have given worlds to have acted as in days of boyhood, have strained him to my breast, pressed his hand to my lips, and wept over him. My swelling heart choked me. The natural current would not be checked. The big rebellious tears gathered in my eyes. I turned aside, and they dropped in the sea. They came fast and faster. Yet I could hardly be ashamed, for I saw that the rough sailors were not unmoved, and Raymond's eyes alone were dry from among our crew. He lay in that blessed calm which convalescence always induces, enjoying in secure tranquillity his liberty and reunion with her whom he adored. Perdita at length subdued her burst of passion, and rose. She looked round for Clara, the child frightened, not recognizing her father, and neglected by us, had crept to the other end of the boat. She came at her mother's call. Perdita presented her to Raymond. Her first words were, Beloved, embrace our child. "'Come hither, sweet one,' said her father. "'Do you not know me?' She knew his voice, and cast herself in his arms with half-bashful but uncontrollable emotion. 
perceiving the weakness of Raymond, I was afraid of ill consequences from the pressure of the crowd on his landing. But they were awed as I had been, at the change of his appearance. The music died away, the shouts abruptly ended. The soldiers had cleared a space in which a carriage was drawn up. He was placed in it. Perdita and Clara entered with him, and his escort closed round it. A hollow murmur, akin to the roaring of the near waves, went through the multitude. They fell back as the carriage advanced, and fearful of injuring him they had come to welcome. By loud testimonies of joy they satisfied themselves with bending in a low salaam as the carriage passed. It went slowly along the road of the Piraeus, passed by antique temple and heroic tomb, beneath the craggy rock of the citadel. The sound of the waves was left behind. That of the multitude continued at intervals, suppressed and hoarse, and though in the city the houses, churches, and public buildings were decorated with tapestry and banners, though the soldiery lined the streets and the inhabitants in thousands were assembled to give him hail, the same solemn silence prevailed. The soldiery presented arms, the banners veiled, many a white hand waved a streamer, and vainly sought to discern the hero in the vehicle, which, closed and encompassed by the city guards, drew him to the palace allotted for his abode. Raymond was weak and exhausted, yet the interest he perceived to be excited on his account filled him with proud pleasure. He was nearly killed with kindness. It is true the populace retained themselves, but there arose a perpetual hum and bustle from the throng round the palace which added to the noise of fireworks, the frequent explosion of arms, the tramp to and fro of horsemen and carriages, to which effervescence he was the focus, retarded his recovery. So he retired a while to Eleusis, and here rest and tender care added each day to the strength of our invalid. The zealous attention of Perdita claimed the first rank in the causes which induced his rapid recovery. But the second was surely the delight he felt in the affection and good will of the Greeks. We are said to love much those whom we greatly benefit. Raymond had fought and conquered for the Athenians. He had suffered on their account peril, imprisonment, and hardship. Their gratitude affected him deeply, and he inly vowed to unite his fate forever to that of a people so enthusiastically devoted to him. Social feeling and sympathy constituted a marked feature in my disposition. In early youth the living drama acted around me, drew me heart and soul into its vortex. I was now conscious of a change. I loved, I hoped, I enjoyed. But there was something besides this. I was inquisitive as to the internal principles of action of those around me, anxious to read their thoughts justly, and forever occupied in divining their inmost mind. All events at the same time that they deeply interested me arranged themselves in pictures before me. I gave the right place to every personage in the group, the just balance to every sentiment. This undercurrent of thought often soothed me amidst distress and even agony. It gave ideality to that from which, taken in naked truth, the soul would have revolted. It bestowed pictorial colours on misery and disease and not unfrequently relieve me from despair and deplorable changes. This faculty, or instinct, was now roused. I watched the reawakened devotion of my sister, Clara's timid but concentrated admiration of her father, and Raymond's appetite for renown, and sensitiveness to the demonstrations of affection of the Athenians. Attentively perusing this animated volume, I was the less surprised at the tale I read, on the new turned page. The Turkish army were at this time besieging Rodosto, and the Greeks hastening their preparations and sending each day reinforcements were on the eve of forcing the enemy to battle. Each people looked on the coming struggle as that which would be to a great degree decisive, as, in case of victory, the next step would be the siege of Constantinople by the Greeks. Raymond being somewhat recovered, prepared to reassume his command in the army. Perdita did not oppose herself to his determination. She only stipulated to be permitted to accompany him. She had set down no rule of conduct for herself, 
but for her life she could not have opposed his slightest wish, or do other than acquiesce cheerfully in all his projects. One word in truth had alarmed her more than battles or sieges, during which she trusted Raymond's high command would exempt him from danger. That word, as yet it was, not more to her, was plague. This enemy to the human race had begun early in June to raise its serpent head in the shores of the Nile. Parts of Asia, not usually subject to this evil, were infected. It was in Constantinople, but as each year that city experienced a like visitation, small attention was paid to those accounts which declared more people to have died there already than usually made up the accustomed prey of the whole of the hotter months. However it might be, neither plague nor war could prevent Perdita from following her lord, or induce her to utter one objection to the plans which he proposed, to be near him, to be loved by him, to feel him again her own, was the limit of her desires. The object of her life was to do him pleasure. It had been so before, but with a difference. In past times, without thought or foresight, she had made him happy, being so herself, and in all questions of choice consulted her own wishes, as being one with his. Now she sedulously put herself out of the question, sacrificing even her anxiety for her health and welfare to a resolve not to oppose any of his desires. Love of the Greek people, appetite for glory, and hatred of the barbarian government under which he had suffered even to the approach of death, stimulated him. He wished to repay the kindness of the Athenians, to keep alive the splendid associations connected with his name, and to eradicate from Europe a power which, while every other nation advanced in civilization, stood still, a monument of antique barbarism. Having effected the reunion of Raymond and Perdita, I was eager to return to England. But his earnest request, added to awakening curiosity, and an indefinable anxiety to behold the catastrophe, now apparently at hand, in the long-drawn history of Grecian and Turkish warfare, induced me to consent to prolong until the autumn the period of my residence in Greece. As soon as the health of Raymond was sufficiently re-established, he prepared to join the Grecian camp. Here Kishan, a town of some importance, situated to the east of the Hebrus, in which Perdita and Clara were to remain until the event of the expected battle. We quitted Athens on the 2nd of June. Raymond had recovered from the gaunt and pallid looks of fever. If I no longer saw the fresh glow of youth on his matured countenance, if care had besieged his brow, and dug deep trenches in his beauty's field, if his hair slightly mingled with grey, and his look considerate even in its eagerness, gave signs of added years and past sufferings, yet there was something irresistibly affecting in the sight of one, lately snatched from the grave, renewing his career, untamed by sickness or disaster, the Athenians saw in him, not as heretofore the heroic boy or desperate man, who was ready to die for them, but the prudent commander, who for their sakes was careful of his life, and could make his own warrior propensities second to the scheme of conduct policy, might point out. All Athens accompanied us for several miles. When he had landed a month ago, the noisy populace had been hushed by sorrow and fear. But this was a festival day to all. The air resounded with their shouts, their picturesque costume, and the gay colours of which it was composed, flaunted in the sunshine. Their eager gestures and rapid utterance accorded with their wild appearance. Raymond was the theme of every tongue, the hope of each wife, mother, or betrothed bride, whose husband, child, or lover, making a part of the Greek army, were to be conducted to victory by him. Notwithstanding the hazardous object of our journey, it was full of romantic interest as we passed through the valleys, and over the hills of this divine country. Raymond was inspirited by the intense sensations of recovered health. He felt that in being general of the Athenians he filled a post worthy of his ambition, and in his hope of the conquest of Constantinople he counted on an event which would be as a landmark in the waste of ages, an exploit unequalled in the annals of man, when a city of grand historic association, the beauty of whose sight was the wonder of the world, which for many hundred years had been the stronghold of the Muslims, 
should be rescued from slavery and barbarism and restored to a people illustrious for genius, civilization, and a spirit of liberty. Perdita rested on his restored society, on his love, his hopes, and fame. Even as a sybarite on a luxurious couch, every thought was transport, each emotion bathed, as it were, in a congenial and balmy element. We arrived at Kishan on the 7th of July. The weather during our journey had been serene, each day before dawn we left our night's encampment and watched the shadows as they retreated from hill and valley and the golden splendour of the sun's approach the accompanying soldiers received with national vivacity enthusiastic pleasure from the sight of beautiful nature the uprising of the star of day was hailed by triumphant strains while the birds heard by snatches filled up the intervals of the music at noon we pitched our tents in some shady valley, or embowering wood among the mountains, while a stream prattling over pebbles induced grateful sleep. Our evening march, more calm, was yet more delightful than the morning restlessness of spirit. If the band played, involuntarily they chose airs of moderated passion. The farewell of love, or lament at absence, was followed and closed by some solemn hymn which harmonized with the tranquil loveliness of evening, and elevated the soul to grand and religious thought. Often all sounds were suspended, that we might listen to the nightingale, while the fireflies danced in bright measure, and the soft cooling of the aziolo spoke of fair weather to the travellers. Did we pass a valley? Soft shades encompassed us, and rocks tinged with beauteous hues. If we traversed a mountain, Greece a living map was spread beneath, her renowned pinnacles cleaving the ether, her rivers threading in silver line the fertile land. Afraid almost to breathe, we English travellers survey with ecstasy this splendid landscape, so different from the sober hues and melancholy graces of our native scenery. When we quitted Macedonia, the fertile but low plains of Thrace afforded fewer beauties, yet our journey continued to be interesting. An advance guard gave information of our approach, and the country people were quickly in motion to do honour to Lord Raymond. The villages were decorated by triumphal arches of greenery by day, and lamps by night. Tapestry waved from the windows, the ground was strewed with flowers, and the name of Raymond, joined to that of Greece, was echoed in the aviv of the peasant crowd. When we arrived at Kishan, we learned that on hearing of the advance of Lord Raymond and his detachment, the Turkish army had retreated from Rodosto, but meeting with a reinforcement they had retrod their steps. In the meantime, Argyropilo, the Greek commander-in-chief, had advanced so as to be between the Turks and Rodosto. A battle, it was said, was inevitable. Perdita and her child were to remain at Kishan. Raymond asked me if I would not continue with them. Now by the fells of Cumberland, I cried, by all of the vagabond and poacher that appertains to me, I will stand at your side, draw my sword in the Greek cause, and be hailed as a victor along with you. All the plain from Kishan to Rodosto, a distance of sixteen leagues, was alive with troops, or with the camp followers, all in motion at the approach of a battle. The small garrisons were drawn from the various towns and fortresses, and went to swell the main army. We met baggage wagons, and many females of high and low rank returning to Fairy or Kishan, there to wait the issue of the expected day. When we arrived at Rodosto, we found that the field had been taken, and the scheme of the battle arranged. The sound of firing, early on the following morning, informed us that advanced posts of the armies were engaged. Regiment after regiment advanced, their colours flying and bands playing. They planted the cannon on the tumuli, sole elevations in this level country, and formed themselves into column and hollow square, while the pioneers threw up small mounds for their protection. These, then, were the preparations for a battle, nay, the battle itself, far different from anything the imagination had pictured. We read of centre and wing in Greek and Roman history. We fancy a spot, plain as a table, and soldiers small as chessmen, and drawn forth, 
so that the most ignorant of the game can discover science and order in the disposition of the forces. When I came to the reality, and saw regiments file off to the left far out of sight, fields intervening between the battalions, but a few troops sufficiently near me to observe their motions, I gave up all idea of understanding, even of seeing a battle, but attaching myself to Raymond, attended with intense interest to his actions. He showed himself collected, gallant, and imperial. His commands were prompt, his intuition of the events of the day, to me miraculous. In the meantime the cannon roared, the music lifted up its enlivening voice at intervals, and we on the highest of the mounds I mentioned, too far off to observe the fallen sheaves which death gathered into his storehouse, beheld the regiments now lost in smoke, now banners and staves peering above the cloud, while shout and clamour drowned every sound. Early in the day Argyropolo was wounded dangerously, and Raymond assumed the command of the whole army. He made few remarks, till, on observing through his glass the sequel of an order he had given, his face, clouded for a while with doubt, became radiant. "'The day is ours!' he cried. "'The Turks fly from the bayonet!' And then swiftly he dispatched his aides de camp to command the horse to fall on the routed enemy. The defeat became total. The cannon ceased to roar. The infantry rallied and horse pursued the flying Turks along the dreary plain. The staff of Raymond was dispersed in various directions to make observations and bear commands. Even I was dispatched to a distant part of the field. The ground on which the battle was fought was a level plain, so level that from the tumuli you saw the waving line of mountains and the wide stretched horizon. Yet the intervening space was unvaried by the least irregularity save such undulations as resembled the waves of the sea. The whole of this part of Thrace had been so long a scene of contest that it had remained uncultivated, and presented a dreary barren appearance. The order I had received was to make an observation of the direction which a detachment of the enemy might have taken from a northern tumulus. The whole Turkish army, followed by the Greek, had poured eastward. None but the dead remained in the direction of my side. From the top of the mound I looked far round. All was silent and deserted. The last beams of the nearly sunken sun shot up from behind the far summit of Mount Athos. The sea of Marmora still glittered beneath its rays, while the Asiatic coast beyond was half hid in the haze of a low cloud. Many a cask and bayonet and sword fallen from unnerved arms reflected the departing ray. They lay scattered far and near. From the east, a band of ravens, old inhabitants of the Turkish cemeteries, came sailing along towards their harvest. The sun disappeared. This hour, melancholy yet sweet, has always seemed to me the time when we are most naturally led to commune with higher powers. Our mortal sternness departs and gentle complacency invests the soul. But now, in the midst of the dying and the dead, how could a thought of heaven or sensation of tranquillity possess one of the murderers? During the busy day, my mind had yielded itself a willing slave to the state of things presented to it by its fellow beings. Historical association, hatred of the foe, and military enthusiasm had held dominion over me. Now I looked on the evening star, as softly and calmly it hung pendulous in the orange hues of sunset. I turned to the coarse-strewn earth, and felt ashamed of my species. So perhaps were the placid skies, for they quickly veiled themselves in mist, and in this change assisted the swift disappearance of twilight usual in the south. Heavy masses of cloud floated up from the southeast, and red and turbid lightning shot from their dark edges. The rushing wind disturbed the garments of the dead, and was chilled as it passed over their icy forms. Darkness gathered round, the objects about me became indistinct. I descended from my station, and with difficulty guided my horse so as to avoid the slain. Suddenly I heard a piercing shriek. A form seemed to rise from the earth. It flew swiftly towards me, sinking to the ground again as it drew near. All this passed so suddenly that I, with difficulty, reined in my horse so that it should not trample on the prostrate being. The dress of this person was that of a soldier, but the bared neck and arms and the continued shrieks discovered a female thus disguised. 
I dismounted to her aid, while she, with heavy groans and her hand placed on her side, resisted my attempt to lead her on. In the hurry of the moment I forgot that I was in Greece, and in my native accents endeavoured to soothe the sufferer. With wild and terrific exclamations did the lost, dying Evadne, for it was she, recognised the language of her lover. Pain and fear from her wound had deranged her intellects, while her piteous cries and feeble efforts to escape penetrated me with compassion. In wild delirium she called upon the name of Raymond. She exclaimed that I was keeping him from her, while the Turks with fearful instruments of torture were about to take his life. Then again she sadly lamented her hard fate, that a woman with a woman's heart and sensibility should be driven by hopeless love and vacant hopes to take up the trade of arms and suffer beyond the endurance of man privation, labour and pain, the while her dry hot hands press mine and her brow and lips burn with consuming fire. As her strength grew less, I lifted her from the ground, her emaciated form hung over my arm, her sunken cheek rested on my breast. In a sepulchral voice she murmured, This is the end of love, yet not the end. And frenzy lent her strength as she cast her arm up to heaven. There is the end, there we meet again. Many living deaths have I borne for thee, O Raymond, and now I expire, thy victim. By my death I purchase thee. Lo, the instruments of war, fire, the plague of my servitors. I dared, I conquered them all, till now. I have sold myself to death, with the sole condition that thou shouldst follow me. Fire, war, and plague, unite for thy destruction. O oh, my Raymond, there is no safety for thee. With a heavy heart I listened to the changes of her delirium. I made her a bed of cloaks. Her violence decreased and a clammy dew stood on her brow as the paleness of death succeeded to the crimson of fever. I placed her on the cloaks. She continued to rave of her speedy meeting with her beloved in the grave, of his death nigh at hand. Sometimes she solemnly declared that he was summoned. Sometimes she bewailed his hard destiny. Her voice grew feebler, her speech interrupted, a few convulsive movements, and her muscles relaxed. The limbs fell, no more to be sustained. One deep sigh, and life was gone. I bore her from the near neighbourhood of the dead. Wrapped in cloaks, I placed her beneath a tree. Once more I looked on her altered face. The last time I saw her she was eighteen, beautiful as poet's vision, Splendid as a sultana of the east, twelve years had passed, twelve years of change, sorrow, and hardship. Her brilliant complexion had become worn and dark, her limbs had lost the roundness of youth and womanhood, her eyes had sunk deep, crushed and overworn, the hours had drained her blood and filled her brow with lines and wrinkles. With shuddering horror I veiled this monument of human passion and human misery, I heaped over her all of flags and heavy accoutrements I could find, to guard her from birds and beasts of prey, until I could bestow on her a fitting grave. Sadly and slowly I stemmed my course from among the heaps of slain, and guided by the twinkling lights of the town, at length reached Rodosto. End of Volume 2 Chapter 1